security prisons in the remote southern tip of Africa are where I'm lucky enough to spend my spare time writing my next book. And the tech world in London, but by nature everywhere, is what takes care of my day job. That's where I'm co-founder of a company called OneLeap. So it's not often that I get to plausibly weave any kind of narrative thread through the schizophrenic existence. Through these two polar worlds, one a world that is physically and philosophically closed and disconnected, a world of people that society is holding back to protect itself. And then the other, a world where the only barriers are really bandwidth and imagination, that's open by creed, that's hyper-connected. So I was delighted to be asked to speak about the power of the human connection, which is really the single shared thread that can be woven across these two existences. The story of a group of murderers who reached out to destitute people in their community and changed their lives. And the challenge of creating better connections online in a world where connections by their sheer ease and volume have been so devalued. With OneLeap, we tackle this challenge of how to get and give better attention in a way that's a bit like Robin Hood meets money laundering. So on OneLeap.com, anyone, whatever their background, can send a short message to anyone else but only if they put up a fee, the table stakes, as it were, seeing me in Vegas, a fee which shows they're serious, which filters time wasters, which acts like a kind of special delivery sticker for the person getting the message. Both sides benefit. On the one hand, getting through with guaranteed good attention. On the other, being able to prioritize the more personal, more serious messages. The twist is, once the fee's done its job, we then give it away to a great charity chosen by the person who gets the message. So what we do is we hardwire making a difference, which we all want to do if it's made easy for us, into the creation of better business and professional connections. Now this wish to make a difference takes us to my other world and to three wishes, which kind of signpost the beginning, the middle, and the end of this remarkable story that over the last dec decade or so has been unfolding quietly in the secluded winelands of South Africa. And for the first wish, we have a man lying in his bath on a chilly evening. It's a small government issue house that stands in an incongruously beautiful amphitheater of mountains, blue peaks. In front of it is a vast green dam, and to the right of it, separated by a copse of trees, is the most secure prison in South Africa one of the most violent countries in the world. I just want to do something, says the man, Jacobus, he's talking to his wife, something to make a difference to a lot of people, something big that really matters. She says, like what? How big? I don't know, he says, in frustration. And his voice is, is tired. It's been one of the hardest years of their life. At home has been the the worry of thinking their daughter is going to be um, born with Down syndrome at work, where he's a prison social worker. Every attempt to change things has been thwarted. He says, I don't know what I want to do, but I want it to be big. I want it to be so big, it becomes a household name. He says, but it's big like Coca-Cola. And um, his wife, Salma, smiles at him, at the absurdity of this image, but also in sympathy, because in a place where his projects as small as trying to get prisoners' birthdays recognized have been stamped out, the idea of doing anything seems pretty improbable, and the idea of doing something really big seems impossible. And she's probably right that something big would have been impossible. It, it took something so unreasonable, so audacious, that it could succeed where other more sensible ideas had failed. And this particular idea was so enormous that Jacobus himself, when it came to him, in the form of eight maximum security prisoners, didn't recognize it. And what he didn't know then was that these men 
all black men had come to him against protocol. He was a white, he is a white social worker, because they had heard him over to talking in the corridors to other inmates, the only person in this vast prison they had ever heard talking to inmates like they were also human beings. And in this, they took hope. And for this reason, they asked him to help them, to help people with AIDS in their communities, and specifically to help orphans. And Jacobus thought and said, this is impossible. And for good reason. South Africa had just undergone the biggest change in its history. President F.W. de Klerk had given way to President Nelson Mandela, once the world's most famous prisoner. And black men and white men, black women and white men, white women could now eat and work and live and love alongside each other. But little of this change has reached this prison. Sure, men are sentenced in the same way, but the gangs still rule it. White and black fractures are still so strong that the white and black social workers are only assigned people of the same race. And the idea of reform is an idea only. Musical instruments are banned in this prison as part of the punishment. So he says impossible with good reason. But fortunately, men like Jacobus are never deterred by the impossible for very long. So he eventually gets back into it. And we find him for the scene of our second wish, standing in a bright, sunny day on an airstrip by a small aircraft, helping a young boy called Tabang into a tiny airplane. The boy is 11. He looks about eight. He is so thin. He's got sores on his arms. He has AIDS. He has lost his whole family to AIDS. He also has spina bifida. And now he has the most extraordinary group of adopted fathers in the world. These eight maximum security prisoners who over the last few months with Jacobus's help have cut up their own clothes and painstakingly sewn this boy new clothes, have won the right to grow a vegetable garden to give him food. And who, when his birthday approached, said to him, what did he most want to do in the world? What did he most wish for? And Tabung said, I would like to fly. And so they dispatched Jacobus, this man who had made this big wish, off to the local airfield. And he said tentatively, hesitantly, I have these eight maximum security prisoners who've adopted an AIDS orphan who really wants to fly. Can someone help me? And one of the pilots said, sure. And the boy's wish was granted. To the final wish, we have to leap forward about a decade, a decade during which this group of prisoners, called the Group of Hope, has changed the lives of scores of men in this prison and of hundreds and hundreds of orphans in the local township, which um, they've looked after by growing food, by making crafts to raise money, to buy them clothes and other essentials, and by throwing them a party once a month at the prison. And one of the most abiding images of my life is of these toddlers at one of these parties and of young teenagers running towards this 12-foot fence, holding on to it and shouting in excitement at the idea of getting into the prison. Now, this group has a self-imposed code of conduct, one so strict that in 10 years there hasn't been a single incident in a group with men whose murder includes the murder of other children, the murder of a wife, the murder of a mother, the murder of random men and women on the street for no other reason than the color of their skin, and the murder of Marika de Klerk, the former wife of the former president, F.W. de Klerk, who shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela. But society at large doesn't like prisoners helping orphans, whatever the reform. And one of the most remarkable things about this group is that it has survived despite the attempts to crush it, fueled by bureaucracy, narrow-mindedness, and good old-fashioned jealousy. It survived like an infection of hope in this conservative community, this inflexible system, um, and this fractured country. 
And part of the reason is that the scale of the connections between these people has garnered the support of so many unlikely people in the community who fought for it. One of them is a woman called Marguerite, who to the scorn of her friends, never lets a week go by without visiting these prisoners or orphans. And we find her now, the scene of our third wish, in the prison infirmary visiting a man called Sichli, who's developed acute tuberculosis. It's nearing Christmas, she's sitting there with no mask. I won't wear a mask, she said, these men are my sons. And she asks him what he most wishes for in the world. And Sichli says, I'd like a proper sit down meal with my family. And um, she can't grant him this, but she arranges a sit-down meal with his prison family. And so, a few days before Christmas last year, Sechle, four men from the Group of Hope, and three prison guards sit down together at a long table laid with a white tablecloth set with proper cutlery and crockery and real wine glasses filled with sparkling grape juice hired specially by Marquette for the occasion. And she serves them a three-course meal as they talk and laugh like they've done this every day, like they have all the time in the world, and they've never done this. And on the wall, there's a clock ticking towards two o'clock when they will be locked up till the next morning without another meal. These men are fed so little that unless they have extra money, they can't afford to play sport. Their energy levels are so low. And yet they pass each other food first, and with restraint that's become a hallmark of this group, they leave food on the table at the end of the meal. At the end of the meal, when one of the guards has tears on his face, and then they go back to their cell, designed for 20 people, which has 40 people in it, with one uncovered toilet between them, where they will sit for the next cramped hours and roll strips of paper into beads to make into jewelry to sell to support the orphans. But in this work, they find pleasure and dignity, for, as one of the men called Ori says, we're not just rolling beads, we're rolling children's futures and opportunities. So coming from that world back to this one is quite a jump. But for me, what these orphans and these prisoners in their world tell us about this is that the more unlikely the human connection, the greater the barriers to it, the more different the people connecting, the greater the potential of that connection. In their world, it's connecting men of different races, societies, captives and its captors, Muslims and Christians, children and men. In our world, it's connecting people from different backgrounds, different educations, different perspectives, different geographies, breaking out of the networks around us full of people like us. And the wonderful thing about good human connections is they often benefit people in the most unexpected times, in the most unexpected ways. Jacobus, the, the man who made the first wish, was one of the casualties of the audacity of his own wish. Uh, he was persecuted, uh, his family, um, family suffered for it, his career prospects suffered for it, and it took him to a place where he ultimately had to make some very bold decisions in order to continue to do what he cared about so much. And he told me what turned him, what gave him um, the courage to make that decision. It was a conversation with the same prisoner, Ori. And he was explaining what he had to do. And he said, Ori, I'm scared. And Ori said, Mr. Pantsukro, what I've come to learn is that if what you're trying to do doesn't scare you, it's not worth doing. So I guess uh, I leave you just with a final wish, and that is that you find a way to stay open, however much your immediate world seduces you to being closed by all its demands. Because while you never know where that, that next conversation or idea that changes your day or your career or your life is going to come from, and while it's probably not going to come from a guy in prison, you can wager it's definitely going to come from someone who doesn't think like you do. Thank you.